Good morning and welcome to the 2017 fall kickoff for the School of Education. It's really an honor to stand up here and get to see so many familiar faces that we haven't seen since spring. So thank you and thanks for joining us today. This has been an exciting year for the School of Education, if exciting means busy, a little frenzied, and a lot of work to do, but also if it means good colleagues, and if it means the ability to impact educators in our area. I often say this, and so for the full-timers, you hear it a lot, but I'm still amazed by this. I do believe that second only to the power of the gospel to transform lives is the power of education to change the trajectory of individuals and families and communities. And so what we do is holy work, and to be able to do it in partnership with other believers is a very special thing. And so at the same time we are professionals, we are also Christ followers. And our chance to gather today is a reminder of that intersection, of faith integration, of what in Romans 12 and the message talks about taking our everyday, ordinary, walking around life, our eating, sleeping, and going to work life, and presenting it as an offering before God. And we do that both as Christ followers and professionals. And so today is a day to Pass on some information that you need to know, a chance to meet colleagues who are teaching courses similar to yours or the same as yours, but also a chance to cast our vision for this year together and to thank you for the work that we get to do together. Um, some of the, uh, a quick overview of some of the changes that occurred this year. First of all, we greatly exceeded our enrollment ex expectations, which is both good news and bad news. The provost is here, so it's all good news for him. <laughs> However, all of the faculty from school counseling and school psychology and the adjuncts, would you raise your hands, and the staff also. This is the group that had a 40% increase in their enrollment year over year. And so they were doubling up classes, splitting classes, figuring it all out. So a big thank you to you for all that you did. Late October, the Division of Teacher Education re received news from um, the CTC that the standards were changing for elementary and secondary credentials and that they were to go into effect by this fall. Now, they, I actually made an extra trip up there and said to them, you clearly don't understand how higher ed curricular change works because for us to get these standards late October means we have to get them into our system by early February, which means that between now and Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, we have about six weeks, I exaggerated a little bit, <laughs> Uh, to get done what we need to do. And the faculty of teacher education, special education, just did a remarkable job of rewriting an entire curriculum that now means that our students will be co-educated to understand the span of education, but even more that it developed some very creative courses, and uh, you'll learn a bit more about that today. But again, if you're a part of the Division of Teacher Education, would you raise your hand and let us just give you a big thank you. And so a few years ago, um, we made some significant changes to the EDD, meaning we pulled it down and didn't offer it for two years so that we could take time to consult with our district partners and to define what every doctorally prepared school leader needed to know. And we launched that program uh, two years ago. We're entering with our third cohort. But that means that the faculty of the doctoral program has spent extensive time in learning all new curriculum. Um, our district partners have helped us well with recruiting. And we have the largest class in a very long time coming in. At the same time, there are significant changes occurring at the master's and credential level in educational leadership. And so we have been very engaged at the state level to make sure that our programs are in new alignment. And so if you're a part of the division of the Department of Educational Leadership, can we see your hands and thank you for your work on our behalf?
And finally, through all of this, the real glue that holds us together are our staff. And so not only in planning today, but in a year of significant transitions, we relied a lot on their expertise and their eyes and ears to help hold us together and advance us forward. So I'm gonna, they're gonna hate this, but it's okay. If you are staff in the School of Education, would you please stand so we can thank you? I know, they're gonna hate it, but you need to know who they are because they just do remarkable work. Don't tell the other deans, but we really do have the best staff team on campus. So, um, As we begin this morning, it's just a distinct pleasure to have um, our next uh, speaker come and share a bit from her heart and also pray over us as we begin this new year. Peggy Campbell is the chair of our board of trustees. Um, she's the first woman to ever chair our board, but more than that, she will be known for her great leadership during some times of remarkable um, unevenness in Christian higher education. She has helped keep the board and administration in great dialogue and has really helped steady um, a ship in a time that many Christian schools are struggling. Um, more than that, she's someone that loves the Lord and she heads an advertising agency just kind of on the side in addition to teaching here on campus in our undergraduate program. And so I was really honored when um, a few months ago she said, if you ever want me to come and speak to your group, I'd be happy to. I figured she was too busy and had never tapped her. So that was the wrong thing to say because we're delighted that you're here, Peggy. And will, will you um, join me in greeting her as she comes to the stage? start by saying, no, 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 no. I did not say I wanted to come and speak. I said I wanted to just come. And so uh, that's why I'm here, is to learn, which I already have uh, this morning. Thank you, Dr. Hank, for your words, which were fruitful to me as uh, serving on the Board of Trustees. But I did quickly say yes to the invitation because it affords me an opportunity which sometimes I get at the beginning of the year at kickoff, but now I can say it to just the School of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to hear words that we've exceeded enrollment, I can tell you as a trustee, is a powerful encouragement alone. But even more, um, looking at the fabulous bag of goodies that we all got today, um, Inside of my packet, I found this morning the reason, I think, for the joy. So let me just remind you of your mission statement. It says, based on Christian values and principles, the APU School of Education prepares educators to be creative, collaborative, critical thinkers, and scholars for diverse educational settings. What I know is that if you are going to teach that, you must be that. And I want you to know that your renown as a place um, that exemplifies the fulfillment of this, this mission statement is a keen awareness to those in leadership at APU and beyond. Um, as a school of education, that is, as an institution for education, you are, as Anita already shared, in some measure the very focal point, the, the laser focus. And if we don't do well what happens in this school, how could we do well otherwise? And what I know is that you do your work well. So I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your scholarship. I get to see the um, periodic updates on the, what is being done by the faculty at APU, and it's always a joy to read of um, your extra effort that goes beyond. In so many ways, you edify those who watch your example. So would you join me in a word of prayer as I thank the Lord for you 
and then invite you in a moment to watch a film with us. Father, um, much as Paul would write to his uh, churches and children in Christ, I just want to thank you on every remembrance of those who populate the School of Education at APU. These are men and women who are influencing decades, generations that many of us will never see. But the influence for Christ and the nurturing of world changers is their calling. And I thank you, Father, that they seize hold of that with such vigor and joy and creativity and collaboration and critical thinking and all that you call them to be and do as people of faith who care about educating men and women to pass the baton. Today and each day of this year that unfolds as we live and thrive in being even better together, Father, we invite you into our hearts and lives and work that we might truly come to the year end with gratitude for what's been accomplished in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. A few weeks ago, well, let me say, I am not, as some of you might know, I'm not an APU alum, and I'm not a mother, so I don't have kids who were alum. One of the ways that I have enjoyed getting better acquainted with faculty, as well as staff and students and alum, is by being subscribed to the Life on Film series that we produce at APU. A few weeks ago, I was so deeply moved, might get a little emotional here, um, but I was so deeply moved by the reminder of the outcome of your labor in watching the video of one of your alum being taken back at the influence of her life in a place that's replicating yet again the opportunity to nurture and grow up young adults, even younger than young for some of you, and older than young for others. Um, so would you join me in watching one of the remarkable stories of the men and women that you are shaping in the story of Dr. Kim Law? And turn your eyes to the video here. Thank you. So with my dad, you know, not having anything or we had to leave everything behind, he um, pretty much set foot in America with $5 US dollars in his wallet. So we had to start from the bottom up. My father knew he needed an education, so he pursued that and he found his way into a vocational school to be an electrician. Going to study to provide um, made me realize I won't have the ability to give back unless I actually have gotten an education and a good career. You know, I guess it inspired me. So I had goals of becoming a doctor, and in my mind, being a doctor and helping patients was giving back to the community, but I ended up in education. In that first semester, I taught middle school life science and physical science, and I hated it. It was not what I thought it would be. All of those kids at the time, I had an acronym for them, and I called them WOW, worst of the worst. And I'm thinking, this is not for me. So every day, I, I was banging my head against the wall, like, what am I doing? What did I get into? But that's OK, it's paying bills. And so that Friday before winter break, I remember being so excited because I'm like, I'm out of here. I don't have to see these kids for two weeks, and I'll, I'll worry about getting through second semester and then just quitting at the end of the year. So that evening, I drove out. Some guy was veering off from the carpool lane. So he came in and he hit the Honda Civic. Both cars hit me from the back. So they rushed me to Huntington Memorial and, and I was in a coma for a few months. So at that time I had, you know, all my friends, all my colleagues uh, come visit. And so one of the teachers who was kind of like my mentor, because she knew I was struggling that first semester, she brought in a bag of letters 
from the students. And as I was reading through, I mean, hundreds of cards from these kids saying, we miss you, you know, and I'm thinking, how much of an impact could I have made in one semester? But at that moment, I remember sitting in the hospital and looking outside the window and I thought to myself, you know what? God kept me alive so I can continue fulfilling his mission, which is to service the kids. I had started the program and Dr. Daniel Lawson, he was one of the professors for one of the classes. And I thought, oh, I couldn't do this. You know, I can't do this, it's just too much work. And I emailed him, I remember saying, hey, Dr. Lawson, I don't know if I'll get these papers done. I think I'm gonna withdraw, you know, I don't know if this is for me, maybe it's not the right time. And I remember he picked up the phone and he called me. He said, we're, we're not gonna quit on you. You're not gonna quit on yourself. And he said, you, you know, I'll give you time, just get it done. And so at that moment I thought, if he can believe in me, I think I can do it, and so I need to believe in myself. So currently I am the director of an Eastville STEM Academy. We talk about access for all students, so as much as teachers want to say, hey, we need to set GPA limits on any of the kid who wants to apply to STEM, I said no, because sometimes even that 2.0 kid, they're good with tinkering, they're good with building computers. They might not be good in, you know, in their language arts or, or another subject area that that's not their strength, but we have to believe in them, like Dr. Lawson believed in me. We have to believe in these kids. I have this quote and it is, um, you can't be what you can't see. And the reason why I, I feel like I kind of live by that is because unless I had seen my dad go to school, I'm not sure that I would have been able to. So I think the modeling piece and, and just showing students is very important because I've seen the flip side of it when people didn't believe in students, how they just shut down. We have to see the potential in the students and that's what pushes them. That's what will make them, you know, go beyond. I had a, a, a group of students, they all graduated from high school. I'm still in touch with them. They're now doctors, they're now engineers, you know, working for a big company. So to see them grow up and now to be engineers and to be doctors, to me, that potential, imagine if nobody saw that in them, where would they be? It's a special honor that we have Dr. Kim Lu Lao with us today. And I've asked her to share a bit of her story with us, and she wants to talk to you about the impact um, this institution has made on her life. Welcome, Kim. Um, thank you for having me here. It, uh, you know, watching that film is very difficult, and so, um, but I did show it to my son the other day because I was curious to know what a four year, four and a half year old, you know, if he couldn't understand the film. So after watching it, I'm, a, I'm in tears. He has this big smile on his face and he says to me, he goes, Mommy, God is great. God saved you, so he's my hero. So I smiled really big and I realized um, that that event in my life was a, a, a true blessing in disguise because it, it reminded me of our, my purpose, of our purpose and why we're in education and that is to advocate for our students. So as I was still recovering, and I, I remember being in my orthopedic shoes and, and still in um, a cast, because what you don't see in the video is the injuries that I sustained. Pretty much everything on the left side of my body was fractured from my skull down to my left shoulders, and I had uh, toes that were amputated but sewn back on. Thank goodness for nail polish. So I was treading up the hills of, of Cal Poly Pomona to get my credential and to get my master's. And at that time, when I had finished, I, I realized, you know what? Right now, I'm making an impact on 180 students a year. But imagine if I became a leader, I can impact about 100 teachers. And with that, those teachers can go back into their classroom and impact 180 students of their own. So it occurred to me at that time, I said, you know what, let, let me consider leadership because I think I can make more of an impact. If you just do the math exponentially, it's greater of an impact being a leader. So I started to research um, universities and I came across APU and, and I live here locally and I looked up Azusa Pacific University, never heard of it, I was just down the street at Cal Poly Pomona and the first thing that I noticed um, on the website was a cross. And so I said, let me look into this, that piqued my interest. So I looked into, um, kept writing the, the website, I was reading uh, the information and I came across the four cornerstones, Christ, scholarship, uh, community and service. And right away I knew that 
the core values, the university's core values aligned with mine. And I said to myself, there was no doubt in my mind that this is the place that I needed to be. So I enrolled in the program in fall of 2006. And I, I keep telling myself it really was time management because I love to write and research, but I just could not get the work done because I still, teaching was my priority. So um, that first semester I took a class with Dr. Jenny Yao, who has, is now in China, and I took a class with Dr. Daniel Lawson. And it was that Saturday before the last week of, of the semester ending. And I just, I had two more papers to write. It was my strength-based leadership class. And I said, I just couldn't do it. This is finals week. I have papers to grade. I have projects to do. So um, I emailed Dr. Lawson. And I, I realized this, you know, here's a tip. If you want to avoid a, uh, an immediate conversation on, a, on a, a critical issue, you email them on a Saturday at 9 p.m. So I did that with Dr. Lawson. And that wasn't the case for him. He picked up the phone and he called me right away. He said, you know what, Kim, you are not quitting. I'm not going to let you quit. You, you have, you know, the, the willpower to get this done. He goes, all you need is time, so I will give you time. So he gave me that two weeks of winter break, and I, I worked on my paper. And um, at that moment, I didn't realize it, but that was pretty much the start of my educational leadership uh, journey here at Azusa Pacific University. So for the next two and a half years, we had classes at that time. It was on Wednesday from 4 to 9, I believe. And so despite a long day of teaching, I was so excited. I think I was even out the door before my students were. I was excited to come to class because it was during that time where I was able to, to collaborate with my cohort and my professors. That was a time where I was able to exchange great ideas. That's when you know, we were spurring innovation and, and sharing of best practices. And it was during that time that I realized that there is no stronger a force in education than the power of collaboration. And so that was where I felt like I was growing as a leader and I felt like the APU community was my personal learning network where I, I, was, being, I was able to grow and learn as a professional as well as, as an individual. So three years later, I realized it was time for me to work on my dissertation. I had finished the coursework, which I was a little bummed about because I didn't see my colleagues weekly. Um, I decided, you know, I'm ready for leadership. So at that time, I don't know that they have it now, uh, but I took the administrative credential exam and I passed it. And I didn't have to study for it, but then again, I had just finished three years of coursework, so I did study for it. I passed the exam and then I was offered my first administrative job by Dr. Beckler here, uh, in Corona Norco. And I remember I th said to myself, I go, am I really ready? What am I to do? This is my first administrative job, and I'm going into a district that's the eighth largest in California, and I'm at a school that's about 3,500 students. What am I to do? So I dialed up every single one of my APU professors. I said, if you had one advice to give me, what would it be? So pretty much it came down to, Kim, you need to learn to listen. You need to just sit back and observe your first year, and you need to develop relationships. Because it's through the relationships and the trust is what will get staff to move mountains for me. So I made the decision at that time to put my dissertation on hold, and I said, I really need to focus on this job, and I need to do it well. So for a couple of years, I, I was at this high school, very large high school, and we try to bring, what I learned at APU, I try to bring that power of collaboration to the site. And I worked along with the teachers. I rolled up my sleeves and I got in the trenches with them and we were doing the work together. So after about two to three years, staff wasn't moving mountains for me, but they were moving mountains with me. So after that, at that point, I said, okay, you know what? I, I, I feel like I'm okay here. Now I need to pick up on my dissertation. So I called Dr. Uh, Lawson. I said, hey, I'm back, I'm here, I haven't left. And he said, well, Kim, you know, I just gotta tell you, he goes, I'm, I'm gonna retire in July. I said, no, you can't quit. I believe in you, you can do this. <laughs> so he said, well, I have to retire. So I um, then reached out to Dr. Jenny Yao, yeah, which she, she's not here today, but she really was a driving force in pushing me to get my dissertation done. So my research is in uh, females in STEM education and careers, and as we know, we're trying to close that, um, that participation gap and that representation gap. And as I'm working on my research, uh, my superintendent, my current superintendent said, hey Kim, we're opening up a, a high school a STEM academy, and with your research and all the work that you're doing and your background experience in biochemistry, we want you to, to lead our vision. 
And so I thought, this really, God has a plan for me because this job is just perfect for what I'm doing. And I was able to, to take my research and, and put theory into practice. And that's what I'm currently doing now. So as I, my last year, as Dr. Liston and Dr. Railsback really pushed me to the finish line, I was named the director of this STEM Academy High School, which right now we do have an enrollment of about 350 students. And the school is currently being built as we speak. And it would open in the fall of uh, 2019. So with that, um, one last thing I, I want to say before we, we, you all move forward to do the work that you're here to do and, as, and before I go back to work on Monday and continue to do the work that I do. I know that our work can be tiring. There are days where we, we will be tired and there are days where we will feel like we're beat down and we're on the ground. I know that because I had three of those days last week. But yet we continue to wake up every morning and, and we continue to do the work that we do. And so I'm reminded of this by the Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So Azusa Pacific University, thank you for shaping me into the leader I am today. Our next speaker doesn't need much of an introduction to many of you. Dr. Mark Stanton has been a part of the APU community for longer than most of us. Nearly 28 years, am I remembering correctly? He arrived as an adjunct. So for those of you that are adjuncts that aspire to be in higher ed, there is a career path. And he, um, was, he helped develop the graduate programs in psychology here. He was the founding dean of the School of Behavioral and Applied Sciences that opened um, 11 years ago and then, let me think, seven years ago became provost of the university. And as provost and chief academic officer, he has considerable impact both on vision and direction, but he's also an amazing leader and a cultivator of people. And I'm really blessed to get to work for him, um, but I'm also blessed to be able to introduce him to you. I brag on you a lot, and so welcome to the School of Education, Dr. Stanton. It's always fun to be with the School of Education because I used to be with the School of Education. You know, for a long time at APU, we had what was called EDUCABS. It was Education and Behavioral Studies. And I had a little saying about that, but I won't share that this morning. But, um, you know, we were a part of that group, but we were always, always dwarfed in the behavioral sciences by the, the great size of the School of Education. And so when BASS was created, Behavioral and Applied Science, it was splitting that school so that education could go on and do what it does and, and we could expand in other areas. But I have been part of a lot of discussions and a lot of meetings where I heard a lot of things about what was happening in the School of Education over the years. We have a number of interesting things happening in our society today, some very challenging, very challenging for us. And we'll be speaking to some of those at the kickoff next week for the entire university. But one of the interesting things is this phenomenon of public opinion about higher education and how public opinion has been changing and the intensity of that change in a very short period of time where we went from what I, I think was just an assumption that you know if you had children they should go to college and if you wanted to get ahead you should get a college degree and if you wanted to get further ahead you should get an advanced degree and those assumptions are being challenged today in part because of the cost of higher education but those challenges are impacting us now every day. And so I, I really appreciate, Kim, uh, your testimony and what's happened in your life because you are an example of what we're all about. Because I do believe, as Dean Hanks said, that education changes lives. And it helps people to lean into their life in a way that they can be all that God intended them to be. But we've got to be able to demonstrate our value and our meaning and purpose to society at large. Because when society starts to believe things or they start to question long-held beliefs 
and replace them with new beliefs or at least new questions. Politicians start to pay attention, don't they? Because politicians are elected by those individuals. And so they know if they're going to be elected, they've got to reflect the concerns and the sentiments of the populace. And so we have seen a very significant shift in government, nationally, but especially here in the state of California, saying we're going to get more involved in education than we've ever been. And it's happening across the board, from K-12 to higher education. While there's always been engagement and involvement, now there's a different kind of involvement, isn't there? A kind of involvement that says, we're going to start telling you how it's going to be. And that may be a good thing. Because sometimes we all need to be challenged, don't we? We need to be challenged to say, are there things that we have thought about who we are and what we do that we ought to change? Are there some things that we've been doing just because we've always done them that we ought to change? But it's incredibly painful when someone who isn't in your field learns some about your field and have some advice about your field, but then they start telling you what you ought to do. And that's where we are today in higher education in many striking kinds of ways. And I could give numerous examples, but one of the biggest ones facing higher ed about K-12 education, as you know, is this whole shift, and the bill was passed, that said that in California, there's an expectation that higher ed institutions will find a way to offer a teaching credential embedded within a bachelor's degree, or at most in a fifth year at the undergraduate level beyond the bachelor's degree. Well, that's a huge change in paradigm for us, isn't it? Because we have all sorts of assumptions about what it takes to adequately prepare someone to go into the classroom and to do a good job. And many of those things hold great validity. And some perhaps need to be questioned. But whether we like it or not, we're going to have to question all of it, and we're going to have to look at how do we adjust, how do we flex, and how do we consider what we can do to well prepare K-12 educators, perhaps in a different way than we've been doing it. And we don't know yet what all the implications are of that, but I can tell you we're going to be at the forefront of doing that. We're examining that, we're part of the pilot to look at that, and we are going to figure out ways to do it. But those are the kinds of changes that we have to deal with regularly now that says, we just can't do what we've been doing. We have to think about how we do it differently. I I wanna thank all of you in the School of Education for responding to another government mandated kind of situation we had, where government told us that we need to get on uniform terms across higher ed. And so at Azusa, uh, we have had this um, kind of Winchester House evolution You know the Winchester house where not all the staircases connect and some doors open to nothing and, you know, things are just added on over time? Well, we did that with terms. We were creative and innovative, and so we added terms to kind of do whatever we felt needed to be done. And so we ended up with, they told me one time, I think it was 72 different term models at the university. It was some incredible number. But what we came down to is that because of some of the challenges around financial aid awarding and other government restrictions, especially with military students and veterans, that we needed to bring all of our terms into a kind of conformity. And so in the School of Ed, I know that the real challenge for you was taking nine-week terms and turning them into eight-week terms. And that isn't easy to do. You know, some people would look at it from the outside and say, well, it's just one week. Yeah, it's just one week. (laughs) But it's a lot of work. And I know, again, you leaned into that and you made that happen. So we have an interesting and exciting year ahead of us. We're continuing to expand into our regional campuses. They are a key part of Azusa Pacific University. 
And many of you, especially those of you who are adjuncts with us today, are teaching for us at our regional campuses. And those are powerful places of engagement with students who could never drive to Azusa to take their education, but they can drive to one of the regional campuses to get it there. And some of the online versions of our program are the hybrid courses that we're offering. And so we're again looking at how we can continue to enhance our ability to educate through hybrid modalities, through face-to-face -face and online, and to do that in a better way. We're increasing technology in some of our classrooms to be able to support that and to allow that to happen better. One of the, uh, the great things that the School of Education has done well is to pay attention to the significant role that adjuncts play in the work that we do. So we have our core faculty who are here all the time and working hard, and then we have our adjuncts, most of whom, most of you who are in the room today, who are involved full-time or at least at some level in K-12 education, and you're teaching for us in addition to that. And I know that that can be a challenge, but having this event on a Saturday is real and meaningful, but also symbolic because it's set on a Saturday so that our adjuncts can be part of this because you are valued by this school. And the work you do is a significant part of the contribution that we make in educating students for the K-12 arena. School of Education was incredibly successful last year. Anita mentioned some of the things that were accomplished. I love uh, things like that 40% growth rate because now that that's been shared here, I'll go to some of the other kickoffs for schools and share what the School of Ed is doing and uh, the expectation that they match your 40%. Yeah. But, um, you know, we, we go through a very elaborate process of looking at what we're likely to be able to accomplish in enrollments in a school. And we're going to do that this year in, in about a month. We're going to start doing that process looking at what will happen next year. So, you know, we're entering 1718, but at the beginning of 1718, we're planning for what we're going to do in 1819. But one of the exciting things this last year in 1617 was the School of Education came in far above its original projections. And that's really powerful for the university. It helps create um, some of the fiscal stability that we need across the university to operate. And so I appreciate the hard work that all of you do to make that kind of work possible. One of the other things that the populace and then the politicians are recognizing that we have known for a long time in higher ed, but haven't always done well, is the importance of collaboration, and especially interdisciplinary collaboration. And so I know in your discipline and in your school, you're looking at having some classes co-taught because it's important for people who bring somewhat different perspectives because of their specialties to interact and for students to see that interaction because that's the real life of what happens in the schools in which they're going to teach, isn't it? You don't teach in isolation. You teach in an interactive way with the other disciplines and your students are in, impacted in an interactive way. And so we're recognizing as a university we need to do more in a collaborative way to work together effectively, even at the interdisciplinary level. And so we continue to look at research grants through our Faculty Research Council where faculty from one area can work with another area, even outside your school, to conduct research that is going to have an impact on your field and your development. So I really applaud your emphasis this year on collaboration, and I encourage you to lean into that and to find it a meaningful engagement and a meaningful time of working together with other people and stretching the way you think. Thanks for all you do. I hope you'll have a really great year this year as you interact with your students. Thank you. One of the things that also is important for us is to continue to be engaged with our uh, district partners and with teachers in areas surrounding us. And so about three years ago, um, the state of California with a variety of entities within it, including some funding from the Gates Foundation, some support from CTC, 
uh, the new school for teachers, a variety of groups came together and launched this initiative that is called Better Together. It's the Better Together Summit. And so we actually got their permission to use Better Together as our theme for this year to make sure we weren't in some branding problems. But it really is built on this idea of EdCamp. And so I don't know if you know much about EdCamp. About 12 years ago in Philadelphia it began. And actually when Nori Connor brought this idea to me, I just said to her, I'm going to have to think on this a little bit. Because you go to a professional development day and nothing is pre-planned. Now for a type A person, that's a little hard thing to think that we might be hosting several hundred people and we had nothing planned. So all these things that went through my mind was, suppose it doesn't work. Well, I know teachers will talk, but will it stay on point? Will it be useful or will people, will somebody monopolize and take the whole time complaining about what's happening in their district, not that it ever happens? It was marvelous. Um, we had people arrive, they post notes on a board of the topics that they're interested in. Good qualitative methodologists get together and put like themes together, assign a topic to a room, and then it is um, put out there and people go to that room. The idea is that you vote with your feet. And so if you get in there and it's not what you thought, it's not like conferences that you go to, that you get in a room and you feel stuck and you go, I can't leave, but this is not what they advertised. You vote with your feet. And if it's not what you need, there's supposed to be no shame in getting up and walking out. And it actually works. You can say supposed to, but it actually worked. And so we um, did not host two years ago because we had just finished our accreditation and we were about as tired as we are this year. Um, but we did host a year ago and then again this year. And so we're just going to show you some photos from that to give you an idea of some of what happened and, um, and to really share the joy that took place on campus uh, thanks to the good work of Nori Connor. There are kids looking back and they think about everything you've done in their life, the things you've said, the, the, the words that have come out of your mouth, words of life that have empowered them. And that's why I'm telling you, the words we speak, the actions we make every day in our classroom empower our students. And so as educators, we must recondition our students to let them see that there is no failure, there's only feedback, and that there is value in failure and in its power of innovation. We actually pay for things, and this is something that honors us as professionals, and it supports us, and it's just awesome. I'm getting the chills to um, get a chance to just be with other teachers, and, and the investment that we do, it's, this is priceless. The most valuable thing that we've learned today because we came in a group is um, that we're all an important part of a, a special network of people that really care and are passionate to prepare the next generation. And we've learned a lot and grown a lot from sharing each other's experiences. Consider. How might you contribute to this culture of collaboration, not only within your classroom, but at your site, within your district, maybe across the state? Because talk really does matter. Thank you again, Nori, and to all the staff that were a part of that. And if any in the room attended, come back next year. I think we'll do it again. Um, before I begin my remarks, I just want to um, give acknowledgement to two staff who have really spent a lot of time planning this and carrying out such a beautiful day. And so uh, Christina Taylor joined us eight months ago. And this is her first time to experience it, and she helped plan it. And so she's just done a great job. It's been a lot of work, um, but a lot of individualized touches that I hope will make the day special for you. So thank you, Christina. 
Jessica Estrada is behind the camera right there, but it's our events and communication coordinator. First of all, it's always interesting. She takes pictures of everyone, but she hides behind the camera herself. But uh, we're just delighted for your vision and your hard work in the midst of a very busy time. We had a new student orientation down in Murrieta on Thursday night. This event today, another new student orientation on Monday night. And um, so thank you for your extra work and for your vision for all of this. Thank you so much. We won't call upon every item in the packet, but I would say that um, within your packet is a lot of good information, some of which we'll reference a little later today, but I do want to just bring a couple of things to your attention. There is a quick reference for academic policies and expectations. There's lots of rules, but these are the top ones that would be particularly important for faculty to know and staff to help interpret for you. Um, as the provost indicated, our calendar, so I'm working on the left side from back to front. Um, as the provost indicated, our calendar has changed. For those of you who are adjuncts and haven't been a part of these big discussions, um, you have always known that fall two ends at the end of January, which is kind of interesting because that's not only not fall, it's always, almost all the way through winter. Now we're on a little more of a traditional schedule, which means a couple of things. Nine-week terms are now eight-week terms, and there's no one week between to grade. Um, it means that, that fall actually ends at the time that there's winter commencement, and so then we're done. And then we come back January to May, and spring is done. And then we have an eight-week summer term, so we will not be having to collapse an eight-week course into a six-week course, but we are collapsing nine-week courses into eight. Got that? It's complicated. Um, so we thought that it might be helpful to you to have all of the dates in one location so that you can plan ahead and you can adjust your syllabi accordingly. Um, you have been given uh, the School of Education phone list, um, a quick overview of just some fun facts that occurred this last year, um, as well as, um, as the mission statement. On your right side is the organizational chart. And a notable thing is this last year, I did a little bit of double duty, but so did lots of people. We were without a chair, and so I served as interim chair of the Division of Teacher Education, which is our largest um, division, and in that year helped cultivate um, some additional leaders who are now carrying forward. And so we've created a Division of Teacher Education, recognizing that there are a lot of things in common, while there are still distinct differences between elementary secondary education, which is now a department on its own, um, special education, and then advanced studies, which are the standalone masters relative to teaching, as well as the masters that combine with credentials uh, to make a master's program. Um, so we now have a division and, and two separate departments, um, as well as some new roles that are mentioned, as we've talked before about Dr. Andrea Liston. Um, this will help show a bit, and there also are um, some vacancies that we will be seeking to fill, and so, if you are aware of people that are looking, particularly we're gonna be posting for special ed faculty in regional campuses, um, as well as some other faculty positions, um, and we are looking um, for um, a few other positions here. So I wanted to bring those to your attention. Several of our speakers have already alluded to this topic that I'm going to uh, draw on today, but this power of collaboration is an uh, interesting theme, um, and actually research goes back quite a long time. But I would say higher education has been one of the later um, industries to adopt it in some settings. In fact, I think it was about 10 years ago when Karen Bowden was a student of mine, she was on a research team that I led of about half a dozen doctoral students in doctoral higher ed looking at uh, the impact of collaboration on learning, on teaching, on industry, and on the world around us. And so as I was thinking um, on, on preparing this topic, what my mind was really drawn back to um, was uh, some work that, was, that a few of us were involved in about a year ago. So in early summer 2016, I was really privileged to be a part of a small group of academics and scholars who traveled together to, to Cape Town, South Africa for a unique opportunity to study varied aspects of that country and its people post-apartheid. 
Six months earlier, we had gathered as a group to begin to read books and articles together and to meet pretty regularly for discourse. We discussed key social, moral, ethical, and spiritual issues about South Africa and apartheid. And then in late May of 2016, we left Southern California and made the 10,000 mile journey to South Africa. Once in Cape Town, we were privileged to have quite a lineup of speakers that, um, that we either went to or came and spoke with us. These were eminent scholars, grassroots activists, Christian ministers and educators, and local nonprofit and community leaders. We toured museums and universities and townships. We spent hours together in a van as we kept our appointments and completed our tours. And so when I think back to that time, I will forever remember the beautiful views from the plateau that is Tabletop Mountain. If you've ever been there, it's just simply gorgeous. The seaside views of the Cape of Good Hope. The wonderful conversations about, around lunch and dinner tables with our travel companions. And really learning deeply about the depth of good work that has been launched within communities. Yet today, more than a year later, I still find myself reflecting on the ability of a country such as South Africa, with such a dismal and troubled history, to have so many people who are reaching out across historic divides to move their communities and universities and country forward. And by doing so, they're moving themselves, their families, their neighbors, and their organizations forward. While it was apparent that economic inequities still exist, and some infrastructures are significantly lacking, and these aren't small issues and can't be minimized, what was also evident was the indomitable spirit of our South African presenters, and that still provides me hope for our own country, communities, and organizations in some troubled times. It leaves me with a sense of awe that the seemingly impassable obstacles that have been traversed in South Africa are making good progress. On that trip, I was reintroduced to the concept of Ubuntu, something I'd previously heard intellectually but hadn't observed holistically. As you probably know, Ubuntu is a Bantu word. Archbishop Desmond Tutu defined it this way, it's the essence of being human. It speaks particularly about the fact that you can't exist as a human being in isolation. It speaks about our interconnectedness. You can't be human all by yourself, and when you have this quality, Ubuntu, you are known for your generosity. He went on to say, we think of ourselves far too frequently as just individuals, separated from one another whereas you are connected, and what you do affects the whole world. When you do well, it spreads out, and it's for the whole of humanity. And so perhaps this quote is at the heart of, my, of the progress my colleagues and I observed in Cape Town. We, as 21st century world citizens, are part of a great paradox. We have the potential to be more connected with people from around the world through technology, Yet we can use those same technological devices to hide views that don't represent our own. We can choose to only follow on Instagram, Twitter, or news feeds agendas and thoughts and ways of being that already support our preconceived notions. We can make ourselves no longer challenged by ideas that are different than our own. With one click, we can block people on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter or elsewhere who we once friended and now we defriend. Our social isolation can be very real. It means we can retreat to a virtual or real world of like-minded people and at best avoid and at worst attack those who are different than ourselves. This can happen in the workplace, in churches, and sadly, even in families. So our our concept that we're going to carry forward this next year of better together, rather than being separate and more isolated, 
really is a part of the growing movement of collaborative projects being developed across the professions. When educators design learning spaces in consultation with artists, we move from focusing just on functionality to valuing aesthetics and its impact on work satisfaction and student learning. Similarly, when we update our programs to represent market reality, we advantage our students even when it might feel uncomfortable for ourselves. Any time that we can ensure that multiple perspectives are considered instead of single points of view, we can work to vision instead of just to task. We can design creatively what could be instead of simply repeating or incrementally improving what we already know. So I've been considering what does this mean for us as educators? Western education has long been designed on the principle of the sage on the stage. Once the classroom door is closed with an individual teacher and their students on the inside and the rest of the learning community and the world on the outside, we believe that learning begins there. At least that's how we sometimes practice it. Yet, if this is our 21st century perspective, we've shortchanged ourselves and our students. Historically, in our professions, isolation and individuality have been the norm. Anyone with a doctorate has to prove that they've learned something that nobody else knows in order to defend their dissertation. So we create this for ourselves. And so this isolation um, and individuality means that we don't collaborate instinctively as well. And we often have not been systemically supported for cross-border ventures. We've seen silos occur, sometimes with few conversations occurring between elementary and secondary education leaders, between general and special educators, between mental health providers and, and administrators, among others. And ironically, as we gather as a school of education, we need to acknowledge that the divide between K-12 systems and higher education means that it's pretty infrequent, at least to my knowledge, for chairs of university departments such as English and history and chemistry to reach out to districts and site-based disciplines to make sure that there is content alignment. And without this alignment, we really risk two ends of the spectrum. Students becoming bored with duplication as they transition into higher education and other students gapped because we aren't prepared to receive them where they are. The reality is this isolation isn't best for our students and their learning, and it's not even best for us as educators. I remember as a new interim dean walking around to departments, and one of the things I asked just to create new knowledge is, what are you doing to learn how to connect with what's happening right now in K-12 as opposed to when you left it a year, five years, or 10 years ago? And so we've continued those conversations. We're limited by what we don't know when we operate in isolation. So on a practical level, as we saw earlier today, we've seen professional development move from being solely planned by well-intentioned K-12 and higher ed leaders of what we're gonna do on Professional Development Day to being able to have it self-led and to be relevant to what's actually needed. Um, this grassroots design of EdCamp teacher, by teachers for teachers has seen a groundswell of support and we even modeled it in the Division of Teacher Education this year and had our faculty do it each for the other. On a practical level, these kinds of things are some of what we need to begin to look at. Recognition of the increased value of educator collaboration led the California Commission on Teacher Education to ask, last October, that the teacher preparation programs statewide provide future teacher candidates with broader knowledge of educator preparation rather than the tradition of solely looking at what they needed for their particular credential. And so we know that students come in as students and we quickly put them into general ed or special ed, but they often migrate back and forth or they begin as general ed and then later are identified. Similarly, when students are transitioning from primary grades to secondary grades, um, there's not always, some, some districts do it well, but there's not always that conversation. And so beginning this fall, all of our teacher education candidates will be in a, in a group of six courses together, so almost half of their curriculum co-learning, um, kindergarten through 12 continuum, as well as general and special education. 
Um, I want to recognize really this extraordinary work of the teacher ed faculty. Um, our students will now leave having understood human development from primary school ages through teen years, classroom management across ability levels, uh, and receive a broader introduction of the scope and sequence of individual disciplines such as math, social studies, among others. We need to know where they're coming from and where they're going so we can be part of the glue that makes it um, seamless. In some cases, our university faculty will be co-teaching individual courses with a colleague from a different content area. Now to go from being sage on the stage with a door shut to having another professional there alongside you is frankly scary. Do I know enough? Suppose I say something wrong. Maybe I had an off night. What do I do? And so we've even worked, um, we still have continued work to do, but tried to provide additional support by bringing in both university and national scholars on um, co-teaching to help prepare us for this. Um, at the same time, the continued collaboration, so we often think of school counseling, school psychology as kind of all the same. They don't, I'm learning still. Um, and so it does mean that this continued collaboration across their sub-disciplines mean that this department has been well poised to absorb some of that extraordinary growth that occurred last year by each area supporting the other. And then as mentioned earlier, the growing success of the relaunch of our EDD program is largely attributed to the strong partnerships we've forged outside the university through our Associate Dean for External Partnerships, through the Superintendents Collaborative that we host, through our Superintendents in Residence, and with our doctoral students who are also K-12 leaders. So when the question was, what should every doctorally prepared educational leader in K-12 know, we went both to traditional faculty and to practitioners. All of this encapsulates Desmond Tutu's Ubuntu definition, where he said, we think of ourselves far too frequently as just individuals separated from one another, whereas we are connected, and what we do affects the whole world. When we do it well, it spreads out, for it is the whole of humanity. So in academic year 2017-18, I'm asking that as a school, we focus on the reality that we are better together. Kim already referred today to the university's four cornerstones, and this idea really supports the university's cornerstone of community, which is described as follows. We believe in community. We are a richly diverse people who value the worth of each individual. Our mission is to encourage, equip, and enable each student to fulfill his or her great potential. And I would go back and say to encourage, equip, and enable each faculty member to do the same and that we in turn can encourage, equip, and enable others. So in practical terms, here are some things we're going to be doing this next year. As one of your gifts in your tied packet of things is a book called The Listening Life, Embracing Attentiveness in a World of Distraction. It's not a classic K-12 or education book. It's by Adam S. McHugh. He was awarded the 2017 Christianity Today Book of the Year Award and it really focuses on listening more and talking less as part of collaboration. After we each read it, and I've not finished it yet either, I hope we'll make time to listen to the other and really hear what we don't even know to ask. Then in each of your folders today is a $10 Starbucks gift card. It's not a lot, it's a start. And what I'm asking is that each of you invite someone you don't know, preferably from within this room, someone within the School of Education, to go share a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea together on us. If you're at a regional campus, draw from someone there. If you are um, a faculty member, invite a staff member. The goal is not to get work done. Relationship is the job. When we think in terms of what we do in a given day, we do an awful lot of tasks. And as we build relationship across lines, um, I think we can hear and listen and understand better. And you're always invited to spend the next $10 of your own to go meet a second person. Um, 
We do want to find a way for you to share the good news of the collaboration. It was, it was so, so funny, funny. Yes, uh, our full-time faculty um, that are on 11 month contracts just came back on contract this week and I was away at some administrative uh, retreats and was back in the office yesterday. And I saw two faculty huddled in an office and I, so I didn't want to interrupt. I was kind of making the rounds, saying hi to people. And they called me in and I said, oh, I didn't want to interrupt. And it was a general ed and a special ed faculty member and they were working together on a class they're going to co-teach. And the first remark from one of them was, we just learned we have a lot more in common than we realized. Sometimes just that process of sitting together, we can learn so much more. We can make assumptions. Uh, we can even just not find time. And so we're hoping we can all do that, starting with me. We also want to expand our investment in staff development in the new year. Much of what we report on a day like today is the work of the faculty. But the work of the faculty is really only possible because of the work of the staff. Staff are our unsung heroes. And we need to change that tune and sing more about them. We're better because of their extraordinary contributions. Their roles are different than faculty roles, but they're the 40 hour a week, stay at their desk people that are the glue that holds it all together. They're the people students can call and know someone will be there, as opposed to emailing on a Saturday night at nine and hoping they don't reply. Um, I'm calling you out. <laughs> it's all good. Um, and, and so, so as faculty, faculty hold very different schedules, schedules teaching, teaching evenings, coming in as adjuncts from a distant location, faculty, faculty going to conferences, a, being a part of committees, and the administrative work that keeps a university going, um, even, even sometimes working from home instead of in the office, um, it means that their schedule is very different. But we rely heavily on our staff to be the point of connection between university policies, department practices, and student needs. And so we're committed to doing more intentional work this year with staff recognition and development. And so I hope you'll join me always in thanking our staff. And then for those of you who are full-time faculty and staff at the university's kickoff next Wednesday, I think you'll hear similar themes from the president and the provost of how we might set aside time this next year to connect with each other. So I've just come back from three days in the desert, which is always just wonderful in August. Um, the academic cabinet meets for one day and the president's council for a day and a half. And we kind of cast our visions going forward for the next year just to solidify some planning that was begun a year ago and even again in the spring. And it was particularly notable to me that independently, the provost and the president are each talking about how we build intentionality of building community together. So I would say it wasn't planned except by the Holy Spirit, but it really is a focus for the university this next year. About two years ago, I mean, I'm sorry, about two weeks ago, one of my author heroes died. Max Dupree died at the age of 92. He was the influential leader of a well-respected furniture manufacturing company, but also the author of several books. I love Renaissance people. And one of his books is entitled Leadership Jazz. Another is Leadership is an Art. And as a person of deep Christian faith, he bridged well the corporate world in which he successfully operated for decades and the life of a Christ follower, including serving for 40 years on the board of nearby Fuller Seminary. I own several of his books, have read them several times each, and have a number of passages outlined. But one quote that came back to mind this last week as I thumbed through some books learning of his, of his passing is this. When we think about the people with whom we work, people on whom we depend, we can see that without each individual, we're not going to go very far as a group. By ourselves, we suffer serious limitations. Together, we can be something wonderful. This concept of Ubuntu and the words of Max Dupree draw strong parallels to Paul's admonition that we are all parts of the body, each with our own worth. And so with some theologians among us, and I'm not a formally trained theologian, I may be stepping into some rough territory, but I'm going to do it. I'm taking, I took the liberty of adapting Paul's words to the Corinthians to talk about our life together in the coming year. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, so this is the chapter just before the chapter about love, he identifies that we are one body but many parts. And so I have rewritten that scripture to incorporate the school of education as, as I draw these remarks to a close. 
So you'll hear vestiges of what you've heard before, and some of it will be very different. There is one APU School of Education, but it has many parts. But all of its many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. So the body is not just made up of one part, it has many parts. Suppose the credential analyst says, I'm not a faculty member, so I don't belong to the School of Education. By saying this, they can't stop being part of the school. And besides, the students wouldn't have anyone to answer their many advising phone calls and clear their credentials. Suppose the adjunct faculty member says, I'm not a full-time faculty member, so I don't really belong to the School of Education. By saying this, she cannot stop being a part of the great influence on our students. If the whole body were a research faculty member, who would get students admitted, reports filed, and expense reimbursements completed? If the whole body were staff program coordinators and administrative assistants, how could it teach future school principals? God has placed each person in the school just as he wanted it to be. If all the parts were the same, how could the School of Education meet all the administrative expectations of Gapuru, Kronos, PeopleSoft, Sakai, Silk Road, and TaskStream, while meeting the faculty academic expectations of teaching, clinical practice, research, and committee work? As it is, there are many individuals here today, but there is only one APU School of Education. The faculty can't say to the staff, we don't need you. The administrative managers can't say to their chairs, I don't need you. In fact, it's just the opposite. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are the ones that we just can't do without. The parts that we think are less important, we treat with special honor. The private parts aren't shown, but they're treated with special care. The parts that can be shown don't need special care. But God has put together all the parts of the School of Education and he has given more honor to the parts that didn't have any. In that way, the parts of the body will not take sides. All of them will take care of one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part shares in its joy. You, we, are the APU School of Education. Each one of us is a part of it. This is the adapted word of the Lord. I do want to thank you personally for your many and varied areas of expertise. We couldn't do it without you. We are large, we are diverse, we're diverse in curriculum, we're diverse in experience, in perspectives, and it makes the richness of who we are. So thank you for your contributions to the life of the school. And thank you for continuing to practice valuing your colleagues even more than you value yourself in this next year. It's an honor to serve alongside of you, and Happy New Year. Hi, I'm Rick Givens. I serve as a SoulQuest chaplain for the School of Ed. I'm down the hall next door to my cousin, Ruth Givens, who's not my cousin. She's about yay tall. We confuse everybody. Um, SoulQuest. I'll give a short um, commercial for that for you that are new to our family. But Kevin Manoya, my boss, developed this vision and forecasted it throughout the graduate programs to care for the spiritual formation for our graduate students. Uh, a couple of years ago, Dr. Hank welcomed me into the hallway and um, so I have a space in the School of Ed and I have the distinct privilege of serving as a School of Ed SoulQuest chaplain. What does that mean? Um, an email will come out at a regional center from a site director or from uh, Dr. Tanaka. Thanks for your emails that get people there. I always joke with you, but it happens. It says tonight there will be a SoulQuest gathering. What is that? That is a slice of pizza usually, a slice from the Word of God, and time in prayer. And so as you see that, may I just invite you as we begin the fall semester, um, the next eight weeks, that you'll see a Soul Quest announcement to say, come and join us, so that we can speak into the students' lives. But I want to just charge you, challenge you to come with them. Please don't send them, but come with them. It just adds volume to the credibility and the, re the reality of this is a piece of, this is actually the central part of who we are as Christ followers with the cornerstones as God first. And as, and as I speak with students and collaborate with them and pray with them, they've chosen APU for a reason, right? And you've chosen APU for a reason. So SoulQuest, when you see that, um, 
feel free to be a part of that. At the regional centers, we have a chaplain assigned to each of the regional centers to serve across disciplines. And then at every grad program here, um, we have a chaplain as well. Um, but I get to serve for the best one. I, I just think that's great. Next door to my cuz. But in the midst of that, she, she walks by and says, how you doing? Hey, cuz. I'm like, who are you? No. OK, sidebar, sidebar. I realize also that I don't know a lot of you, and I drink a lot of coffee. So if you want to just leave this on your table. No, I'm so kidding. I'm, I'm, but I put mine here so that uh, Peggy would steal mine. So here's my uh, challenge. Um, and then next, I think I have an hour and a half and then an offering. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I serve as a chaplain in the Air Force Reserves. I take that hat off and I serve as a chaplain here at APU. And what a distinct privilege to bring God's word. And um, the, the charge for the coming year is our university passage. And so it's on a card as well. We have a lot of cards, but I, I want you actually to take this card out and have it in front of you. So the university passage comes from a tradition that Dr. Wallace has spoken into over the years. He wrote a letter to the community um, inviting us as a community. I want to just read a couple parts of this uh, letter. You don't have this part, but I want to just tell you how do we get to this point and why these passages? So Dr. Wallace wrote this, each year as we unite our hearts, minds, and prayers to select a university passage, he says, I'm reminded anew of God's plan and purpose for community. It fits our theme. It fits what we're talking about. We are asked we, we asked God, he says, to reveal his word for our university this year, and it was encouraging to witness that the very process pulled us deeper into relationship with him and with one another in community. And so the collaboration, it goes on in the letter to say that we've chose two passages you have before you, Micah 6, 8, and Acts 2, 42 through 47. Micah, who is a master of classical Hebrew poetry and champion of the oppressed, eloquently reminds us of God's expectations. We are to do, be just, merciful, and humble. And Acts 2 then spells that out in a beautiful example of how we are to play that out, live that out in our early Christian community. So he says this, it is my prayer that we follow Christ's call to do life together. We will reach out to our neighbors in the next office, the next house, the next city. Not only obey God's call for justice, mercy, and humility, but also hold each other accountable. That's the charge from the office upstairs. That's the charge from our president, but that's the charge from our president who walks among us. And so I just want to kind of break this down a little bit, if, I, if you'd allow me to. Really, I'm just going to focus on the, the Micah passage. Many of you read Micah in the middle of the night. Many of you go to a minor prophet and go, hey, I just want to dig in a little bit. I want to, I want to see what Micah has to say. <laughs> I actually have to go to the beginning, the, the end, you find it. It's on page, I think I know where it is. Let me just read to you what's in front of you. Micah. Six, eight. But actually, let me, let, me get, let me get you set up. Micah says this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then in verse 8 says, do this. He says, does the Lord require of me? And he talks about sacrifices, and he talks about things, and he talks about buildings. And he says, no, 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 no. And then in verse 8, he says what you have before you. He has told you, O mortal, O sinner, Man, woman, oh mortal. He kind of put me in my place again as I read this. Micah says, oh mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Better together, what a theme to fit into this community idea with those three uh, phrases or challenges or placard that you're going to put on your desk, your computer. If you put it on your dashboard, be careful. But Micah says this about the word of God speaking forward. He says he's stepping out of the institutions early in the chapter. It says it's not about institutions and about buildings, as I said, or re religious gatherings. He reminds the followers of Christ. He reminds us that God does not need our worship. He does not need our programs. He does not need those things, but he desires that we bring those in a sacrificial manner. God doesn't require them, but he says, I want you to do this. And through Micah's words, would you say these with me? He says this, do justice, do justice. Okay, we got to try that again because this is collaborative. It's kind of, oh, collaborative, yeah. Do justice, do justice, do. Ah, it's an act, action verb is what I understand. This is the agenda for my life, for your life, to do justice. Social justice, personal justice, ethical decisions that you make on a daily basis. The second one is to love mercy. Will you say it with me? Love mercy. 
love. We know the word is throughout the word of God. We say it, I love Starbucks coffee. I love Chipotle, Chick-fil-A. It's not that word. He says to love. It's an attitude of your life. And to love with an attitude of your life rolls into the next word, which is mercy, which equates into the motivation of God's heart toward us. Henry Nouwen, one of my favorite authors, Catholic priest who passed away in about 1997, I believe. Nouwen says this about this idea. What is important is that we remain deeply anchored in the love of Jesus. Ah, deeply anchored in the love of Jesus. And then secure about who we are in this world and why we are here. Do justice, love mercy. The third one is this, walk humbly. Will you say that with me? Walk humbly. Uh, there's an action word there as well. Walk. It doesn't say to stand or to sit. I don't know about standing humbly or sitting humbly or waiting humbly, but it says to walk humbly. It's an action. It's to move about in our daily lives, walking, living out our story in humility. In humility. Remi humility reminds me that it's uh, not sufficient in ourselves, but we need one another. We need to collaborate and work this out together. I have uh, been poring over a book the last couple of years, read it, read it again, by a guy named Simon Sinek. He did a TED Talk a while back, probably most of you have seen on Start With Why, and his second book is Leaders Eat Last. And Simon Sinek, though I don't believe a Christ follower in his writings, man, he lands it really well. He lands it really well when he says this about leaders eating last, about humility. And he's using a, a military example, though not a man of the military. He uses a military example and says this. The rank of office or the title or the degrees are not what makes a, someone a leader. Leadership is the choice to serve others, he says, with or without formal rank. Leaders are the ones willing to look out for those to the left and to the right. They're often willing to sacrifice their own comfort for ours, even when they disagree with us. Simmons goes on, he says, Leaders are the ones who are willing to give up something of their own for us. Their time, their energy, their money, maybe even food off their plate. When it matters, leaders choose to eat last. I highly recommend the book. But a whole idea is that we humble ourselves and step back and allow others. And so as educators, administrators, as teachers, as staff, how are we to live that out? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly. This, this morning, actually getting off the freeway, I saw an example of it. I was getting off the 210 freeway, and as I pulled off, there was a, there's a homeless man. I've seen him several times. I've tried to do gestures of kindness in whatever way I can, but there was a gal who had deliberately, intentionally, had turned around facing the other way on the road, had gotten out of her car with two bottles of water, and walked over and did justice and showed mercy and showed kindness and walked humbly. I wanted to honk and go, hallelujah. But I thought it would have scared her because the truck is pretty big that I was driving. I'm like, <laughs> but I saw it in action, and she was just expressing kindness, mercy, love, in humility. In humility. So how are you to live this out this year? Think about ways that you might be able to do that. How will we live out our story in the classroom, in the break room, with our colleagues, students, families, parents of our students? How will each of us be a transformed individual who bears those words of justice, of kindness, and humility. With the, your unique gifts and with your unique talents, with your individuality, bringing it to the mosaic that we use this word here on campus quite a bit, what a beautiful picture God has in mind for us the coming year. I love what a great theologian, Tim McGraw, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm a country western guy. Great I'll just keep going. The great theologian, Tim McGraw, says in a song, You'll want to listen to this. You'll grab it later. It says this. You know there's a lot that goes on by the front door. Don't forget the keys are under the mat. Childhood stars, childhood stars shine. Always stay humble and kind. Go to church because your mama says to. Visit grandpa every chance that you can. It won't be a waste of time. Always stay humble and kind. And the chorus says this. Hold the door. Say please and thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, and don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb. Always stay humble and kind. When the dreams you're dreaming come true, excuse me, dreams you're dreaming come to you, when the work you put in is realized, let yourself feel the pride, but always, what? Stay humble 
in kind. And so as we move into this new academic year, you can quote the theologian I just referred to, that's totally fine. He's, he's not, he's not. But as you lean into this and as you wrap your arms around what God has on your plate this year, we juggle a lot, we bring a lot to the, to the fight. And in the midst of that, that we would look to our left and look to our right, that we would acknowledge and ask for assistance, ask for prayer, ask for someone to come alongside of, and that we would be men and women after God's heart. My hope and my prayer as we begin what Dr. Wallace says, the greatest year in the history of APU. To quote it next year, it'll say the same thing, the greatest year in the history of APU. For you newcomers and welcome to the family of APU, for you that have uh, been around a few years like myself, 27 going strong, I'm thinking about sticking around. We are excited, we are excited, I am excited for what lies ahead and how hopefully you'll speak into my life, that you'll grab our chaplains, that you'll come alongside and if we can be that to you as well. But let me pray for you as we uh, continue. Would you bow with me? This is the day the Lord has made. Lord, we will rejoice and be glad in it. As we have already heard in our time together, we focus and center ourselves on you, Christ Jesus. And so I pray you're covering over this entire group for faculty, for staff, for administrators, for even those who couldn't be here today but are part of the APU School of Education. God, would you direct us that we would be men and women that are servant leaders that are leaning into you for our guidance and that we would hold true to these words this year, to do justice, to love mercy and kindness, to walk humbly with our God. And as we flesh that out, as we walk this journey, we do this with great expectation for what lies ahead. And we, we pray your blessing, we pray your divine blessing on this day and the days to come as students will in, enter our classrooms, as faculty will walk amongst us, as administrators and staff will interchange ideas and collaboration God, that you would allow us to be servants after your heart. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rick, for that devotional. Thank you for letting the Lord use you. It's always encouraging to get feedback about SoulQuest. Our students love it. And so those of you who are new, when you get the email from me about SoulQuest, um, please, we really do encourage you to take the moment and take your students to go out and let them be exposed to the word of God, to the love of God. So please, would you stand with me as we do the commissioning together. I'm going to read the part that says leader, and you are going to respond as faculty and staff. And after we have said the prayer in unison, I'm going to pray for you as we end this part of this program. Having been called to this place of service at this point in your life, do you sincerely Commit to engage in the work you do here with total commitment to God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you be diligent in prayer, in the reading of the Holy Scriptures, and in personal studies and preparations to increase your skills and abilities for this work and ministry? Will you earnestly seek to carry forward your work and ministry in sincerity and in love, cooperating willingly with your co-workers and striving to be a positive influence to those around you, to contribute to the spirit of joy, love, and harmony, making this place a peaceful work environment? Let's pray together this prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek 
to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.